Let me first thank the organizers for um, inviting me to speak today and also for the tremendous work they've put into having an online conference. I know I'm very thankful and I'm starting to believe that the memories of previous conferences aren't just a figment of my imagination. So um, I'm going to present today uh, Mellon Amplitudes and One-Dimensional Conformal Field Theories. Um, this is mostly, mostly based on a paper we published this year with uh, Lorenzo, Valentina, and Giulia. Um, and thanks to this formalism, we will also revisit uh, the setup um, that we worked on last year, which is the half of yes Wilson line in ABJM, um, which is in the paper um, below, um, which was with oh, uh, which was with Luca, Domenico. Uh, and also Lorenzo and Va Valentina. So um, my job has been made easy by the amount of talks that have been on one-dimensional conformal field theories, but I will um, still try to motivate why we are interested in these, these theories. Um, the first um, obvious statement would be that these theories are omnipresent. As, as soon as we have a higher dim dimensional conformal field theory, we have uh, a one-dimensional subsector uh, in which we can define a one-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, we can also appro um, approach this from a bottom-up approach as um, the boundary of a quantum field theory in a ADS2. And um, in the context of more physical um, theories, we have all the range of defect theories that you've seen um, this week, notably in the case of w Wilson lines. Now, why would we want to look at uh, Mellon amplitudes in this case? Well, the answer comes from uh, higher dimensional uh, Mellon am amplitudes in which we observe a nice complex analytic structure for these and clear links to scattering amplitudes. Um, this formalism can be simplified in one dimension and um, we will see how and why, why this is interesting. I've included here um, the, the holographic setup in which these um, CFT1 theories um, appear, uh, in which we have uh, ADS2 world sheet and boundary excitations, uh, where the Wilson line is on the boundary and these excitations propagate and interact in the ADS2 world sheet and the dual setup of the operator insertions on this Wilson line. So now, thank, uh, hopefully, um, you, you will want to be looking at CFT ones, but how, how can we study these uh, one dimensional CFTs? Um, at weak coupling, one can use Feynman diagrams and there has been done in, in quite a few explicit case, uh, cases in the uh, past few years. Um, and as you've seen this, this week in uh, Lucas talk, for example, we can use um, localization to look at certain observables in these uh, conformal field theories. And um, also one of the very interesting choices is, is to look at um, integrability uh, through uh, objects like the quantum spectral curve, um, which uh, we saw through the talk of uh, Andrea uh, earlier. Um, however, for this talk, we will uh, be looking um, more at the strong coupling uh, area through three different methods, which are uh, the counterpart of Feynman diagrams for uh, ADS2, which are the Witten diagrams uh, in a perturbative setup. And um, we will also see how um, Mellon amplitudes uh, can be used to, to uh, study these. Um, I did want to say that um, higher dimensional Mellon amplitudes had been used to study one dimensional conformal field theories before, um, but it was um, using this formalism um, and it had a few uh, drawbacks which we, we hope to address in this, in this work. Um, and finally, uh, through the analytic bootstrap, um, which uh, I will talk briefly about because uh, next talk, Pietros will go into more depth. So first, a quick reminder of one dimensional conformal field theory uh, kinematics, uh, especially for the case of four point functions of uh, identical scalars to, to simplify things. So the observable we'll be looking at are four-point correlators. In one dimension, the position of these insertions can be um, mapped to zero, one, and infinity, where 
only one uh, of these coordinates um, is, isn't fixed and will become our variable, the conformal cross ratio uh, Z, which is naturally defined between zero and one in this, in this setting. In this way, our four point, point correlator is entirely described um, by a function of a single variable F of Z. One way to look at this um, function of one variable is to relate it to the OP expansion. So what is the OP expansion? One can uh, expand this function in terms of um, OP coefficients and the conformal, um, the conformal blocks. So these OP coefficients relate the CFT data, so the three point functions to these um, higher point functions through the operator product expansion. And these blocks resum the contribution of uh, all the descendants. Um, this expansion can be done, um, can be seen as, as exchanged operators in, in either the T or S channel, which leads to the crossing equation, which is one of the uh, main constraints in this, uh, in this bootstrap and is, is also quite a physical, uh, physically relevant um, equation. Um, finally, in this introduction, I would want to talk a bit about the holographic uh, dictionary in this case. So this um, dictionary is a bit particular because the um, uh, gravity side is non non gravitational. So the anti de Sitter space um, has is uh, a minimal string surface ending on the line contour, which defines the one dimensional Wil Wilson line, and we have an effective uh, quantum field theory in ADS two. Um, the elements of this quantum field theory will be the world sheet excitations. Um, which will be the deformation of the orthogonal directions at the boundary. These, as I said before, will propagate in the ADS2 space and interact and um, are dual to these operator insertions on the Wilson line. The correlators in this case, in the dual theory, in the one dimensional Wilson line, um, are, are defined as such, where uh, the operators are connected by this um, Wilson line. Um, operator. The way we study these um, perturbatively at large strength tension is uh, via Witten diagrams, uh, and we'll go into more, more details later. And uh, as strong coupling, we can also analyze uh, these, uh, these correlators uh, in, on the CFT side, mainly through uh, analytic bootstrap. And um, here, just as this morning, I'm, I'm showing the um, famous crossing equation, which is one of the constraints of this analytic bootstrap. So now that I've introduced the uh, setup of our um, uh, uh, of our paper and of this talk, um, I want to outline uh, what we'll be going through. So first of all, since uh, this one-dimensional Mellon transform um, was uh, constructive, um, process, I want to motivate why we need this one-dimensional transform, then I want to um, define it and then give a few of the properties as well as the results that were in, in our paper. Um, then I'll spend a bit more time going through two examples uh, to show how this Mellon formalism can be used in these settings. The first one will be um, using this bottom-up uh, approach of a quantum field theory defined in ADS2. Uh, and in particular, the um, higher derivative four-point interactions and seeing how this Mellon uh, formalism can help us. And then in the second example, we'll revisit um, uh, this case of the ha half BPS Wilson line and see whether um, this Mellon amplitude can give us uh, some intuition. So why do we need a one-dimensional Mellon formalism? Um, first of all, the the Mellon formalism has provided a plethora of results over the past 10 years. First developed um, about a, a decade ago, um, it, it has then proven to be a very, very useful um, formalism to, to describe correlators and um, to, to compute quantities. Uh, the notable um, advantages of this are the complex analytic structure and notably the links to scattering amplitudes. So these are present mostly through the fact that um, there, are, there are poles, uh, so quite a physical um, in, uh, interpretation of poles as uh, the exchange operators in this, uh, this OPE, uh, 
Um, but uh, also the complex analytic structure can be used to form um, quantities such as some rules to constrain the conformal field theory um, data. And um, the hope is to link uh, these two scattering amplitudes, which has been done in this um, higher dimension formalism. So in one dimensions, uh, as I showed in the um, uh, reminder slide uh, of um, conformal field theories, we only have one conformal cross ratio. And when we want to talk about scattering amplitudes in two dimensions, we have an equivalent um, single Mendelstam variable. And um, however, the, the, the Mellon formalism is uh, best suited for, uh, in the case of four point correlators, for example, having two cross ratios that are going to be, um, uh, have the, the corresponding two Mellon variables, uh, independent uh, Mellon variables in Mellon space. And through this formalism, we want to have um, the, the single, uh, single Mellon variable that's going to be linked to this single um, cross ratio. Uh, one of the cases in which this can be useful, for example, is when we have a bootstrap result, for example, in, uh, in terms of a cross ratio, ratio space, um, it, it is very difficult to, to uh, find a single uh, Mellon transform in the higher dimensional formalism. So um, I'm, I'm just going to flash a few of the results here because I won't be talking about all of them. Um, but the uh, results of our paper this year were uh, this non-perturbative definition of the Mellon uh, amplitude, uh, an infinite set of non-perturbative sum rules. Um, you have a little diagram here, um, a closed form expression for uh, contact diagrams and some perturbative results for higher derivative um, ADS2 uh, quantum field theory. So um, defining this um, Mellon transform, as opposed to the higher uh, derivative counterpart, we have, uh, we have a certain choice of the Mellon uh, transform that is going to be labeled by this parameter A, um, because uh, T and one plus T are the uh, natural uh, cross ratio um, variables in, in this case. So it's uh, related to the other, um, uh, cross ratio through this. Uh, and the uh, anti melon is going to be uh, the, the equivalent um, natural um, anti melon transform. So the way this is um, computed uh, is that um, our, our cross ratio is going to be the natural uh, variable because the original melon transform is, is defined with a, an integral ranging from zero to infinity and an anti-melon um, uh, seen as a contour integral ranging from uh, the points at the imaginary uh, infinities. In this setting, we have a manifest crossing. So um, we have the crossing in, in position space. So in terms of this variable, um, it has a bit of a changed form, but it, it, it is um, the, the same principle. And in melon space, we have uh, a relation between the Mellon variable S. So the crossing maps S to two delta minus S, which is very reminiscent to um, crossing in Mandelstam vari variables in one dimension. Um, for, this, um, uh, for this talk, I'm going to be setting A to zero, uh, but bear in mind that uh, through different uh, values of A, we have a whole family of Mellon uh, amplitudes that we can define and several of them have uh, different and useful properties. Um, in this case, we have a convergence of the integral um, between these two values. So delta phi is the dimension of the external operator uh, that we're going to consider the correlator of and delta zero is the first exchange operator. So a natural question when we look at this convergence is what happens if this range um, shrinks to zero or even worse is just undefined. So this was answered a few years ago um, by Penedona Silva and Riboyedov um, through, through, through this method. So the reason we don't have a convergence is because of the bad behavior of uh, the function f uh, when t goes to zero and infinity. So imagine we have delta zero, which is going to be smaller than two delta phi minus delta zero. By improving the behavior of f near zero, we shift this um, right limit to the right and this left one to the left until we have a finite uh, region of convergence. This is done explicitly through taking away 
um, the exchange operators um, up to delta phi. And uh, in order to still define the same, um, the, the same object, we need to add the corresponding poles uh, uh, directly in the Mellon transform. So notice here that we only integrate between zero and one um, because we do this process se separately uh, for the t goes to zero and t goes to infinity behavior. So we do the same process uh, as t goes to in infinity and we uh, recover the Mellon amplitude by summing these two contributions. Um, notice that if we don't do, need to do this procedure, uh, we recover our original um, definition. Um, one last detail about this is that um, the contour needs to be deformed in order to keep the poles of the psi zero on its right and those of um, psi infinity on the, uh, on the left. So um, one can see that, for example, this, these green poles are going to be on the left, so you need to go above, and uh, same thing for these red po poles need to be on the right. Um, but then why don't we just do this procedure for um, everything so that we have a region of convergence, which is the entire complex plane. One can actually do this and we recover a block expansion uh, in, in Mellon space. So um, one of the interesting features when we do this is that we have the physical interpretation of these poles as the exchanged uh, operators here. We have explicitly the primaries at delta and all the series of descendants with the sum over k. One can do the same thing as in position space and resum over these values of k, and we find a block expansion. So the explicit form of these coefficients and the block expansion are given below. Um, notice that these blocks um, don't have any, uh, any cuts because they're evaluated in minus one. The s is the argument of these uh, first, um, uh, first components. So uh, as I said, we have these poles at the conformal weights and we have residues in terms of the CFT data. This allows us to find the CFT data given a certain Mellon amplitude. So one can perturb this. And what we find is that we um, perturb about a spectrum that, it, that is known, for example, generalized free field theory. Um, one relates the double poles of the Mellon amplitude to the anomalous dimension and the simple poles of this Mellon amplitude to the OPE coefficient. Uh, coefficients, uh, the first correction to these. Uh, one can follow a similar strategy at higher loops, and it, it, it allows us to extract the CFT data from these Mellon amplitudes. So I've shamelessly stolen a joke from uh, Lorenzo. <laughs> he gave me a silent uh, approval. <laughs> so um, one dimensional co conformal field theories. As I said, we have plenty of examples. Uh, notably Wilson lines. Uh, I'll let you find the exception of the rule. Um, the, the Wilson lines uh, that ha are one-dimensional CFTs um, are, are very prevalent. We have any uh, non-supersymmetric Wilson line in a conformal, um, conformal field theory. We have the half BPS Wilson lines in n equals two and n equals four. Um, the half BPS Wilson line in ABJM um, and also the cases of uh, SYK models and the um, uh, just any quantum field theory in, in ADS2. Um, we'll be studying these two um, examples uh, and the other ones uh, remain to be, um, to, to, to be looked at with this uh, formalism. So for the first example, the higher derivatives in ADS2. So I'll start with a quick review of, of uh, computations in, in ADS2. In principle, this is very similar to Feynman diagrams in which we have uh, vertices, we have propagators, and we have um, a, a certain integral. So um, in this case, for tree-level uh, contact diagrams, we have the um, bulk to boundary propagators that are going to be relevant uh, that are detailed here. Uh, the vertex, which can be either um, a, uh, a constant or um, a, a vertex with a certain number of derivatives and uh, the integration over the bulk. Uh, once we do that, we get uh, the corresponding correlators at a certain um, order in perturbation theory. Um, one of the important quantities in this uh, are the so-called D-bar functions or D-functions, which are the building blocks of these tree-level contact diagrams. Um, uh, these in one dimension are simply the diagonal limit of the higher dimensional counterpart. Um, and uh, 
something that is um, slightly irritating is that these don't have any closed form uh, expression for a general delta, uh, even though they have quite a simple form in terms of um, logarithms. Uh, I have here the first two examples for delta is equal to one and delta is equal to two. So we want to uh, use this formalism to study um, uh, the CFT1 defined as the boundary theory of a quantum field theory in ADS2 with a generic four point um, uh, interaction. So here I've used a bit of an abuse of notation. This isn't simply a differential operator, but this term encapsulates any um, phi to the four interaction with a certain number of derivatives that's labeled um, by the parameter L. So for example, for L is equal to zero, we recover phi to the four theory and we have the correlators given in terms of D bar functions. Um, one can actually um, say something about these um, uh, interaction vertices. We know that Lorentz invariance uh, imposes that, we, um, that the derivatives come in pairs and up to equiv um, equivalence of the uh, equations of motion, we actually find that um, the derivatives have to come in copies of four. So uh, we can label um, interaction terms with up to four L derivatives by this parameter L. Uh, here I have the example, for example, for a phi to the three D two phi uh, interaction, which is uh, going to be uh, equivalent to phi to the four interaction to the equations of motion. So a convenient basis is this particular operator, which doesn't look particularly nice, but uh, through the um, uh, relations of the bulk to boundary operators, we actually give relatively simple um, uh, results, uh, especially in our, in our setup. So in position space, uh, the effect of this correlator is to uh, have D bar functions shifted by the parameter L, which is uh, labeling the number of derivatives in this interaction. Uh, it will also have a certain prefactor, um, which doesn't significantly complicate the issue. Um, however, in position space, since we don't have this closed form expression of the uh, D-bar functions, this shift of L isn't um, uh, just a simple um, um, action to do on these, on these D functions. However, in Mellon space, we have a closed form expression for these um, D-bar functions for integer delta. So in Mellon space, we can transform this where this prefactor becomes certain coefficients and a shift in the value of the um, Mellon variable. And that these are simply the Mellon transform of these D-bar functions, which are known here. And for integer delta, uh, this P delta is a polynomial. So um, now that we have the result in Mellon space, um, since we have this OP expansion in Mellon space, we can extract the CFT data. So we can solve explicitly for the anomalous dimension through looking at the, these double poles. Um, and uh, we find this first uh, equation, which is the inversion of uh, this relation, which was the little uh, reminder. Um, and inverting this explicitly, we find uh, the, the anomalous dimension of a general um, phi to the four interaction with um, uh, 4L derivatives. Um, this sum is, is not a pretty one, um, but um, it, it, it is uh, doable. Uh, we've, uh, we've done the sum explicitly for uh, up to 32 derivatives, and I'll, I'll flash a few examples uh, now. So the general form of these anomalous dimension uh, is going to be uh, of this form, and we've uh, chosen our, our interaction um, coefficient so that we, we could uh, compare results to the bootstrap uh, results that had been done in this setup up to L is equal to three. So for L is equal to zero, um, we can just set L is equal to zero in this setup and we have a constant polynomial. So notice that this first part doesn't change, but this polynomial in N and Delta becomes increasingly difficult. So for L is equal to one, we have this. L is equal to two, we have this. As equal to three, we have this, and um, this is the, the, the first one that, that uh, wasn't in the, um, uh, in the literature. So um, this was a slightly um, constructed example that didn't um, 
have a, as much of a, a physical interpretation in terms of the theories that we're interested in, but it did show some of the efficiency of this um, Mellon uh, amplitude formalism. So the second example um, relates to uh, the ABJM half BPS Wilson line. So the setup of this uh, is going to be um, on the, um, in the holographic, um, in the um, holographic uh, part of it uh, will be the gauge fixed bosonic action of a type 2A string in ADS4 cross CB3. So um, we follow the, the formalism of uh, the equivalent pa uh, paper in ADS5 cross um, S5 of uh, John B. Royban and Zeitlin. Um, where we uh, fix the gauge and we find um, an interacting uh, QFT in ADS2. I haven't in included the uh, vertices, but uh, this perturbative computation ca can be done. Um, so doing this perturbative computation, we found, for example, for the massless bosons, um, uh, the four-point correlator of this. So the fields they're going to be propagating are these um, massless fl uh, fluctuations, which are going to be in the CP3 directions and um, the remaining ADS4 directions, given that two of them are, are aligned with the world sheet. Uh, these will be um, related to elements of the displacement multiplet, um, uh, respectively the, the delta is equal to one and delta is equal to two boson-like operators. And obviously we have the supersymmetric partners that they're also going to be uh, dual to the uh, fermion insertions uh, on this. So here we have the structure of um, these field insertions just for the uh, case of the chiral um, supermultiplet, uh, the displacement supermultiplet. So these are the two that we were talking about of which we, we computed um, this four point function. And um, in this case, we can uh, use bootstrap uh, in the uh, strongly coupled uh, CFD. So the way uh, we do this is order by order in a, the, the strong, in a strong coupling parameter uh, using the uh, hyperlogarithm uh, ansatz, imposing the crossing symmetry, um, also imposing a few um, constraints from symmetry uh, from the selection rules and uh, a few physical input, uh, such as the null behavior of the anomalous dimension and um, the overall constant has to have some external input as well. Doing this, we find a, a, a single solution for the uh, first component of this uh, chiral supermultiplet, um, which is um, of this form. We can then relate this to uh, the other, uh, the bosonic, correlators and we find an agreement uh, with, the, with the perturbative calculation and strong coupling. So I mentioned quickly that we could uh, relate these different elements of the, of the super multiplet. The most convenient way of doing this is uh, through superspace. So in one dimension, we have a very uh, simple uh, superspace structure where we have the um, Grassmannian variables theta with a component um, uh, with an index uh, of the SU2, uh, of the uh, uh, SU3 in this um, setting. And um, the components of this single chiral superfield are going to be uh, these field insertions. The advantage of this setting is that um, we can now look at the correlator of the, these um, uh, chiral superfields. And this correlator will um, be related to uh, the components of this correla correlator will be all the possible um, four point correlators uh, made with these um, component fields. A slight difference in the um, block expansion is that now we need to uh, have an expansion in terms of the super blocks, uh, which are going to be uh, slightly different because of the um, super symmetry, which changes the um, Casimir. And uh, the cross ratio will now be a super cross ratio. Um, and I haven't included the details, but this will have a uh, Grassmannian independence. So doing this expansion, we can relate all these different correlators, but more importantly, um, this solves um, part of the mixing problem. So for those that are very familiar with the mixing problem, this is going to be very basic. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, this is probably going to be very boring, but it's also very important. So I'm, I, I do want to uh, make this quite um, 
clear. So the mixing problem uh, occurs when we have de gener degenerate operators in a, uh, in, in a field theory. So we cannot distinguish um, these two uh, operators um, and find the relevant uh, OP data. So in particular, if we perturbatively um, want to relate uh, a certain result in our correlators to the OP um, data will actually have a weighted sum of the anomalous dimensions as opposed to being able to distinguish these two uh, quantities. So this will happen with uh, correlators that have the same classical dimension, for example, at uh, weight one. So you can see that the different components are going to mix in this setting. If we now uh, look in terms of the chiral superfields, um, this solves it for the first three cases and uh, for the higher di um, dimension cases, um, it, it means that it's actually a lot easier to, to, to distinguish. We only have two instead of having about uh, 16 in this case. Um, on top of this, at this order in, in perturbation theory, the anomalous dimension is actually going to be um, a function of the quantum number as uh, Pietro will talk um, uh, about more in his talk. And, and uh, having this result uh, allows us to, to solve the mixing completely. So all this to, to go on to the melon. So how can the melon transform um, help us in this setting? So given the, the previous results, um, it's a natural question to look at the four point correlators uh, of these FF bar, FF bar. Um, and to take the, the, to use our formalism to take the Mellon transform. So doing this, um, we, we take a Mellon transform. And um, if you recall the Mellon transform of the, of the D-bar functions, we had a form that was much more complicated that had um, an infinite sum of double poles. And they had um, uh, two different components, one that was a, a a cosec times a cotangent and one that was a, a cosec. In this case, we have a finite number of double poles and we have a much simpler form. Um, the, the, the superspace uh, in this setting actually allows us to ensure that all the correlators um, are going to keep um, this, um, this ni nice form. If you remember, we can relate the correlators through differential equations and these differential equations can be inserted relatively quickly uh, in this Mellon transform and relates the different correlate, the Mellon transform of the different correlators um, to a finite sum of a shifted um, Mellon transform. Um, a, final, a final comment is that the anomalous dimension uh, in this case is going to be found through the um, Mellon of the super block, so won't, won't have exactly the same form as before. Um, so I'm going to conclude a bit early because the, 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 the outlook is, um, is going to be one of the important parts of this. But uh, so far uh, in the context of these um, one dimensional conformal field theories, there's an array of tools uh, to compute the CFT data, uh, which is what we're interested in in, the, in this case. So we've gone through Witten diagrams, uh, the analyt trick through XRAP um, and Mellon uh, amplitudes. Um, in this uh, talk uh, and in the paper, we, we wanted to propose a new tool, which was the 1D uh, Mellon formalism for four-point four correlators. Um, this Mellon formalism had a simple analytic st structure, like its higher dimensional counterpart. It had poles at the weight uh, of the physical operators, and it had a consistent block expansion, which allowed us to extract the CFT data. Uh, on top of this, we have a closed form expression for integer delta of uh, the building block uh, D functions. Um, and using this, we can find the anomalous dimension of higher um, uh, derivative models, uh, in particular the, um, with uh, this 4L label. Um, we also revisited the first order analysis of the half BVS Wilson line insertions um, and found that um, this Mellon transform actually has an even nicer um, formalism as the um, uh, component D functions that were used to, to compute this. Uh, finally, uh, this uh, superspace structure uh, allowed us to solve the mixing and relate the different Mellon amplitudes.
Um, so the hopes and expectations uh, on this. Uh, at this point in the talk, I have talked about 40 minutes without um, talking about integrability at an integrity conference, which is not to be um, uh, recommended, but um, <laughs> I did want to um, explain a bit the motivation of why uh, we wanted to de develop this um, melon formalism. The original uh, hope was uh, that through finding this uh, melon formalism, we could um, find um, the nice structure that was observed in higher, uh, higher dimensions, uh, which is linked uh, to, to features that are present in scattering amplitudes. Um, and um, in this way, we, we wanted to be able to, to perhaps link this formalism to um, some kind of um, S-matrix bootstrap. Um, and even um, as in the higher uh, dimensional counterpart, uh, link these quantities to flat space scattering amplitudes. Um, and in this context, it would be really interesting to see how uh, integrability manifests itself in a very, very explicit setting of um, ADS2 um, uh, world sheet excitations. Um, obviously, uh, we, we, want, we want to extend this formalism um, to exchange diagrams, so higher loops, um, but also to um, higher point functions and also to be able to include uh, our symmetry um, factors uh, to be able to look at theories like n equals four superiang mills. Um, and uh, also um, to, to look at bootstrap directly in Mellon space. Um, the reason to do this is that um, as we saw, these D functions are not uh, a necessarily good building blocks if the overall result has a simpler, uh, simpler structure than these D functions. And perhaps there's an ansatz that might be nicer in Mellon space in order to bootstrap um, ABJM or another theory um, to, to a higher uh, loop in this Mellon formalism. Um, that's all. I feel like I'm very early, but thank you for listening. Thank you for the nice talk. So, so first I have a comment and then I have a question. So I, I, let me comment. I think the what happens in 1D that you said that you go from two cross ratios from one cross ratio, it's actually, there's an analog thing that happens in any dimension when you increase the number of insertion points, I think it's D plus two. So if, then, if it's an N point function where N is greater than D plus two, the cross ratios are also not in the So even in higher dimensions, we have the same problem that the melon for higher point functions has too many variables and they're not independent. And um, well, one way to interpret that is that there's some kind of gauge freedom that you can change the melon without changing the correlator. But okay, here you have a concrete proposal. So that was the comment, now the question. The question is, um, in higher dimensions, one of the great things about Mellon, as you said, is the flat space limit. And in practice, it works so nicely because a contact diagram in ADS is just a constant in Mellon. And to get that, you have to like factorize some smart gamma functions that somehow Mark guessed. Yes. And so here, your contact diagrams come out rather complicated. Is there any way of factoring out because in the in the final formulas you had some nice gamma functions yes for the um, other example so what what yes. is the status of that yeah um one um uh one of the other melon transforms actually with a different parameter a uh, in this uh, in this formalism actually has um um melon transform of these d functions that are uh, a product of gamma functions um, with with a certain polynomial in front, um, the the factoring out of um, uh, of these term doesn't quite happen in the same way as in uh, as in higher dimensions. Um, we uh, obviously for contact diagrams we could just factor out the whole thing, but the the advantage is that if we looked at de derivative interactions, for example, we'd have the the corresponding polynomial in front. Um, my understanding is that in the flat space limit, um, 
of this polynomial only the highest um, uh, just the highest term of this polynomial um, uh, survives um, and um, I, I, I've looked at a few cases but I, I, I haven't quite um, figured out whether uh, we, we could have this um, the same feature uh, just because we, we, we don't have a, a, a flat space limit in, in this setting. Um, but the, the hope is that since only the, uh, if we had a similar um, flat space limit, uh, if it's only the highest component, then we would have a probably a ratio of, of um, a rational polynomial whose um, limit in the large S would be um, the, the corresponding. But there is a flat space limit in, in position space, right? For one DCFT. So. Uh, yes, that's what we're looking at uh, right now. We, we haven't done it yet. Thank you. Thank you. 